Because I wanted to prepare it for about an hour, so I left the office and my boss called me back. So I went back. I got here. I got here. Inshallah. Um, any questions before we start? Any any comments? Any observations? Bismillah rahim Anything? Okay. Um, so. Um, Bismillah rahman rahim So this this is the book of Al Imam Abu Hamid Al Ghazali. First thing I remember is uh, what I told what I told you last uh, last week. What you mentioned about talab al ilmali li din dunya. That that was about Ghazali. It wasn't about Lujawani. Forgive me. Yeah. So his father his father died and he he uh, uh, left his uh, two children to two boys, Abu Hamid who is uh, Muhammad and his brother who is Ahmed. Abu al-Futuh, he left them with uh, a Sufi. He was a, this is like a, don't be scared with this word. It's a very common, very, uh, very common word in, in the, the Muslim world and throughout history. And he was an all Sufi man and he gave him all his, uh, all his uh, earnings. And he told him, listen, don't worry, just spend the money on their education. And when he, um, he had spent all his money, he took them to a school. I think you all know the story. May, may not. So he took them to the school where uh, he said, listen, boys, I'm going to leave you here. Uh, you'll have a roof on, on, on top of your head and, and there's going to be food. And they understood that this was you know, a great opportunity just to live, to survive. And that's what, that's what he said later on in his life. He said, طَلَبْنَا الْعِلْمَ لِلْدُّنْيَا وَأَبَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا أَنْ يَكُونَ لِلَّهُ uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, you know, made the intention to, 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 to gain knowledge for the sake of, of dunya. They were not. It's not even about fame and stuff. It's about living, surviving. And Allah has made it su- such that it is. It was for the hereafter. And uh, also, uh, last uh, Sunday when I was preparing for this, uh, I was asked to speak about Imam Al Ghazali. And the Medin for for all of you. So this Friday I'll be uh, giving the first talk on Imam Ghazali himself. So that's just a very very uh, uh, coincidental. Alhamdulillah, nothing is a coincidence. So Imam Ghazali, rahimahullah, was um, was very bright. He graduated three years before his brother. His brother, for me, is more more special, more intelligent, more he had more in depth, and he's the one that guided his brother. Um, when you go to the books of uh, Asir, Asir al you know the, the, the book of Imam al-Zahabi, or Ibn Kathir, al bidayah al-Nihaya, or even the book of Ibn, Ibn Khalikan, Wafiyat al-A'yan, all these books that speak about the great scholars, when you find the biography of Imam Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, it's just a paragraph, because they're expecting you to know him. But when it goes to his brother, uh, Ahmed Al Ghazali, there's like two pages or three or five pages, and he really has a lot to to offer. He he reached what his brother was looking for, in like he, he reached it way before him. He wasn't as bright, but he he reached it way way before him. So this book is a, is like a uh, an, a result of his of his search. Imam Al Ghazali uh, became the most uh, the, the brightest person of his time. I won't go through his, his biography. You can, you'll have to come Friday. So he was like, Subhanallah. He had become like before in his early thirties. He was good looking. He was sharp, smart. No one could, you know, take pick an argument with him. The greatest scholars. You know, when you talk about greatest scholars, last week I spoke to you about how the the um, the people in, in Fas about 800 years ago, they would not be able to wear a white turban until they memorized the Quran, uh, six books of Hadith, al uh, fiat Malik, Manbumat al-Fiqh wa al-Usul, and so on. So those, that's the type of people he was, he was teaching in the early 30s. And they were all bashful in his presence in his early 30s. And he was dressing, he was putting on the most beautiful of the clothes. Like he was wearing, not gold, but golden clothes. So he had everything. He had fame. He had 
he had uh, a name, he, uh, his reputation preceded him, he was super intelligent, he memorized everything, he was almost a photocopy of Imam Shafi'i. Imam Shafi'i was like a, like a sign, Ayatollah, he's a sign of Allah. And he was, he was also uh, very exceptional. And then his brother, <laughs> you know, one day he saw him, he says, what are you doing? Until when is this going to go on? You're teaching people to how, how to purify themselves and you haven't purified yourself. You know, you're on the pedestal and you're like the world. You are the world. Khulafa would write him, like the, the big leaders of, of the nations would write him a letter from the east and the west and they would not move until they took permission from him. Subhanallah. You know, he was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allahumma salli wa sallam ala sallam Muhammad when you see this you can only praise the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, because this only comes in, in, in the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so he went he left he divorced the world he prepared himself and he and he uh, spent and this was a result so he spent the time uh, introspecting about everything absolutely everything with a very powerful mind he had all the tools. He had absolutely all the tools to, to, to question existence, everything, even existence. Like as a, as a, uh, he was a great philosopher, and, and he, he knew all of those uh, Greek and, and, and uh, Roman scholars who, who questioned existence, and he went through that himself. But he was a very sincere person, and Allah guided him. And when he came back, he, he, he wrote this book, Al Hiya Al Maddin. And some say that this book was uh, was uh, very much inspired from uh, the Risala of Qushayri. And Qushayri was very much inspired from Qutb Qulub of the Imam uh, Abu Talib al-Makki. So they took from each other, alhamdulillah, yes. He doesn't have to, to pay tribute to any of them because it's really very, very original. So uh, this... Today, what I want to do is, um, I went through this very quickly yesterday, but I wanted to go uh, over it tonight before coming here. Um, we had gone through, more or less, the first part, which was the virtues of knowledge. Learning and teaching. The virtues of knowledge, fadl al-ilmi wa ta'limi wa ta'allum. And then there is the fadl al this is what I want to go through today, the second part, before moving on to the, before moving on to the, um, perhaps the, the next part of Rubr al ibadat So it starts with Rubr al ibadat This book is divided in four. The first part is al ibadat and it starts with Al-Ilm. And then he speaks about all the, the fiqh, the fiqh of, uh, of ibadat So in this, in this portion of, the sub chapter of uh, knowledge, he speaks about, let's see, Bayani ma huwa fardu ainin, wa ma huwa fardu kifaya. Clear. And then he gets into the philosophical interpretations of, of, uh, of other things. So he, he first ex, 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 um, presents us with two hadith, and this will be the foundation for his chapter. The first hadith is Talab al Ilmi Faridatun. That uh, seeking knowledge is an obligation for each Muslim, every Muslim. And even if there is some 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 weakness in this hadith, especially the the other one, global ilma seek knowledge even if you have to go to, to 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 China. So even if there are, and this is like what the the the, the greatest uh, critic on Al Imam Al Ghazali is that he was not a scholar of hadith. So everybody that speaks about him, praises him. He is the founder of the modern uh, Usul al-Fiqh. His book of Usul al-Fiqh is, is the foundation for the Shafi'i and the Hanbali. Uh, he's, uh, he gave the fatal blow to, the, to philosophy and so on, but he was not a scholar of hadith. And apparently he had studied just a few months before he passed away to study hadith, Bukhari. And uh, you know how he passed away with the kafan on his, his beautiful story that his brother tells us. He knew he was dying, so he went and he told him, ask him, bring me the kafan. He kissed it, and then he faced the qibla and he passed away after duha. 
but there's also a saying, a uh, story about him that he passed away with Bukhari on his chest. Like this. So he was studying Bukhari. They said, had he dedicated himself just one year to hadith, he would have been as exceptional as Bukhari. That's how amazing he was. So he was not, he was not a muhadith. That's why the, the, greatest, the greatest critic of this book is that uh, there are many books, that there are many hadith that are weak. But we have um, a lot of uh, scholars that have worked on this to show us which hadith are weak and, and how weak they are. And the greatest scholars than Imam al-Iraqi, which lived, I think, two or three hundred years later, and his, um, his authentication of the hadith is the most popular, Imam al-Iraqi, rahimullah. <coughs> so, so what do we do with these weak hadith before we move on, right? What do we do? When we speak about a hadith, they are divided into mutawatir, sahih, hasan, and da'if, and, and mawdu'a. So we have mutawatir, which is abundant, uh, uh, chains, and no one... Uh, so this is qat'i. Uh, uh, mutawatir is qat'i. And then there is uh, sahih, mutawatir, and then there is sahih. And that is, um, if it's less than three or, or seven or whatever, if it is mashhur or, or three, it is dhani or ahad, so it's dhani. Dhani means there is, a, there is a level, a level of possibility that it is not as the Prophet said, even though it's sahih, in the way that he said it, like the, the exact uh, lingo of the hadith. But it's, what, what, is, what is the level of, of risk there? 2%, 1%, as the scholars say. So it's dhani, they still call it dhani. And then there's hasan. And Hassan and then there's Da'if, and there's like 30 branches of Da'if. And then there is Mawdu'ah, Mawdu'ah is, is fabricated uh, or put there, uh, and it's not Sahih. And Da'if, we can use Da'if. Don't let anyone fool you. We can use Da'if. What is weak is not necessarily not usable. What is weak can become, can, uh, can become weak, can become strong because there are many, many other chains. Also, we can use the weak in Fada'il Amal. I won't get into the details of Fada'il Amal. It's the beautiful deeds, the actions which are beautiful. We can use them, and there's four, 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 four conditions for that, and so on. So he uses that in Fada'il Amal. These are the beautiful, the beautiful manners, the beautiful deeds. And I'll give you also another... Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. If anything confu is confusing, let me know. I'm going through this very, very, very quickly. So... Imam al-Ghazali and any other scholar could come up with their own uh, with their own ideas. But instead of saying, this is what I think, if they find it in a weak hadith, they prefer to use the weak hadith. And that hadith is, is found, it may be found to be, inshallah, strong because there are others that look like it as well. So he says, Talab al-ilmi faridatun ala kulli muslimin. It is an obligation, seeking knowledge is an obligation for every Muslim. And he also said in this hadith, which is clearly that da'if, but scholars love this hadith. Go anywhere. If you have to seek knowledge, go as far as, as China. And then he says, And now, now we're talking about fardu, fardun means it is, it is an obligation, fardu ayn, an obligation on each person. On each person, even fard kifaya, okay, even the knowledge that is not an obligation on each certain. So there's a difference between it's fard ayin and fard kifaya. You know all of the difference? Okay, so fard ayin, the knowledge which each one of us is now responsible for to learn. We all know, we all have to learn wudu, we all have to learn salah, we all have to learn fatiha. All every single one of us, every single one of us, and fard kifaya. Is, uh, is if one of us becomes a doctor, like uh, Afnet said last week when she, she read this, if one of us becomes a doctor, then the rest of us are not obliged to become a doctor. If some of us become engineers, the rest of us don't have to become engineers. <coughs> sure. So I, I spoke about Al Mutawatir, Al Sahih. Yeah, I'll go. I'll go. Okay. Al Mutawatir. 
الصحيح الأحد الحسن الضعيف الموضوع. So what is, how much is that? So المتواتر is very very brief. المتواتر is when you have multiple narrations of the same hadith. So the same the same hadith, the exact same hadith, or even the same topic. It doesn't matter. So the Prophet said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, eat with your right hand, for instance. Eat with your right hand. And we have this hadith عن عمر, عن أبو هريرة, عن بلال, عن عثمان بن مسلمة, and so Uthman ibn al-Thaqafi. So we have many, many, and each each level has many, many others. Okay. So the Prophet said something, and it is narrated by 20 or 30 uh, companions. And each companion uh, is, it has it narrated by others, like 20 or 30 others. So we have a great amount of narrations. That's mutawatir. As-sahih wal ahad There's a mashhur, and I don't want to get into the details. There's mashhur and ahad. Mashhur is above seven or eight. Al-ahad is, is one, two, or three, depending on the school. So one or two. And one, one very, very famous one, is in the Amal of Niyat. Some say it's mutawatir. It is, it is. Relax. In the Amal of Niyat, it's a very famous hadith. Yes? Come in, come in this way, yes. In the Amal of Niyat, indeed, every action is judged according to the, the, its intention. It starts with Omar and nothing and nobody else. But after Omar, we have a multitude of as Sahaba and Tabi'een. And after that, we have like a like a limited amount, okay. So that hadithun uh, ahad, just from one person, but that hadithun ahad takes the ruling of mutawatir. And you know what I'm saying? Thank you. No, that's good. I like I like like that. Don't let me just speak. So the, the uh, so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said something. So the Prophet is here sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Omar narrates this hadith. And after I narrate it, a multitude of others, tabi'in, will narrate it. So it becomes mutawatir. But between me and the Prophet, it's, it's ahad. It's, there's only one person narrating this. Okay? So this hadith is ahad. It's one person who narrates it. But it takes the ruling of mutawatir. Why? Because when Omar heard it from the Prophet wasallam, all of these guys were here. You understand? Everybody heard it. Had I said, had I lied, they would have said something. You understand? So they all heard it. So the so there's mutawatir, there's ahad, and ahad that take the ruling of mutawatir, and then there's hasan, and there's hasan li uh, So we have da'i that become hasan. So it's hasan li ghayrihi. So we have a da'if. Okay. So there is a chain of narration. This is becoming a, a lesson on on hadith. So we have a chain of narration where I, I said something, the Prophet said something, I, I, I repeated it, and when it came to Ahmed, Ahmed was uh, a little bit old. So we, we are worried that he may have narrated it wrong. Or, okay, so this hadith has also been narrated by him. And that now this hadith becomes Hasanun li ghayrihi. So this da'if becomes hasan. Or this hasan becomes sahih. Okay? Because we have other narrations that are stronger. Okay? The, the, so what I have narrated may not be exactly as what he said, but they have the same meaning. The mutawatir is the stronger. Because it's abundant in, 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 in its narrations. And after that, it's the hadith sahih. Bukhari is Sahih, Muslim. No one doubts Bukhari and Muslims. No one doubts Muatta. Okay? So they're Sahih. But some of it is Ahad. It's just that the scholars are very particular and, and accurate about this. Okay? <coughs> Sorry? Ahad is between one and three. So I heard it and he heard it and he heard it. Between one and three. Okay? And then we have Da'if also. Since we're talking about, you want to talk about the uh, hadith. So if we have da'if, da'if, okay, and we're not talking about mawdu'r, like I said, there's, there's 30 different types of da'if. If, if a hadith is da'if, and 
and it doesn't become hasan. But there are other other ahadith that, that sound like it, so it reaches some level of, of strength, but it's not hasan. It's still da'if. That, that uh, hadith, da'if, can be used for qada'il al-amal, for the beautiful things. Like the Prophet ﷺ said, if you read Yaseen every day, it will protect you from this and that, right? This hadith is, is da'if, but we, we all use it. How, how could you go wrong with reading Qur'an? Okay? And the conditions for using hadith life is that you should say it's hadith life, and you should say it's fadail amal, and the du'af is not very very uh, steep. The, the the weakness of it is not very uh, not terrible, not hard. And the fourth one I forget. You shouldn't say it's the, from the prophet. You, you have some. Is it, uh, if you, if you uh, it, is it used for? Uh, do we we don't use it for the ahkam and aqidah and so on? That's right. So we have we have um, uh, that that's correct in some schools, but in in the in the school of Imam Ahmed, you use it for ahkam. Imam Ahmed, and I, I mentioned this just earlier. Imam Ahmed says that if I come up with an idea, a ruling. And I find this idea in the hadith da'if, I'm going to quote the, quote the hadith and not say that it's my idea. Out of adab with this hadith that has a, 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 an association with the Prophet himself. Exactly. Not to me. I thought about it. Yes, he thought about it, but he found it in the hadith da'if. He prefers to say, it's the, my, my, my proof is this. You see? And, and it's like said, like, like uh, the sister said, what's your name? Maryam, like it's it's uh, it's not like a very serious ruling. Uh, it's not aqidah. So when it comes to aqidah, we only use the very strong hadith. When it comes to uh, to, to the, the rulings of fiqh, we use hadith sahih and hasan. Hasan is, is good. It's just sahih. The hasan came came later. We made it difficult on ourselves. And they're all sahih. Okay, sahih, just make it a little less uh, authentic. And hasan means authentic. Yeah, yeah, hasan means very good. Sahih means extremely good. Okay, so so uh, when it comes to fiqh, we use those. And when it comes to sirah and stories, then we, we, don't, we don't go crazy. Okay, we, we can use the ta'if. We can use uh, we we have a lot of hadith in the in the in, in Bukhari and Muslim about the seerah and tafsir and so on, and and the Prophet even said, "Wahadithu an Bani Israel wa la harash, balighu anni wa la aya wa man kaza ba'ale imutabidan fakad zawa ama qadaw min al nar wahadithu an Bani Israel wa la harash." Then he says, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam." Narrate from me even just one verse, and anyone who makes a lie, upon, uh, like in, in, in uh, he, he he means to lie and he lies, then he should prepare himself a spot in Jahannam, in, in the hellfire. And then he says, and use the stories from Israel. Yes. Does that confuse you? After all this. <laughs> And use the stories from Israel yet wala haraj without any worry. Why? As long as it is had kana mundarijan tahta aslin al usul din. If it is under one of the usul of ad din. Ida kana mundarijan tahta aslin min usul al din. So if you have and, and this is and, and the beauty the beauty of this is that sometimes I, I come down from the member and they, and they, they, they tell me that's an Israeliyat. So in the next khutbah, I, I use uh, the, the, the quote from Imam Malik, and which is quoted by Imam Ibn Hazm. So if, if you have a story from the Israeliyat, but it supports your idea, the beautiful idea, which is Quranic idea, which is Islamic Muhammadan idea, then use it. Wala yeah. haraj. And it's also mean to learn what not to do. Yeah. Can it be 
Very good. Very good question. I mean, the scholars accepted paraphrase. So yes, yes, it can be like so. Um, so you have the same hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, but they are, they are, have different siyah, different wordings, but they mean the same. That's fine. That's perfectly fine. Do you remember the conditions for uh, week uh, in Fada'il Amal. Okay, did you have it? I have three. Go ahead. I, that's what I said, three. Go ahead. Okay, you should say that it's a weak hadith. Yes. You should say that it's only used for Fadal. Yes. And if the weakness is not. Uh, that's what I said. Did you, I thought you were looking it up. You looked it up. No, I oh. was asking. So and the third, the third one is what? third one is if the weakness isn't too steep. And the fourth one is you don't say Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, that's very interesting because we, we, we do that and th that's what the scholars have said. I mean, and there are different uh, conditions, three, four. This one is from uh, Imam Al-Sayyuti or Imam Ibn Hajar. This is what I know. Look it up, yeah, and share with us. Barakallahu fiqh. By the way, mashaAllah, tabarakallah, every time I have halaqa, all the students, uh, they teach me. I mean, you all teach me, mashaAllah. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm shy from you guys and, and mashaAllah alaykum. I, I, I go to my... Uh, my Sira Halakha. Everyone is so knowledgeable, mashallah. I, I just, I learn all the time. So, okay, so so he takes these two hadith and he develops. He says, اختلف الناس في العلم الذي هو فرض على كل مسلم الله في كل مسلم. So he speaks, so he says, طلب العلم فريدة على كل مسلم. It's an obligation for each person, for everyone. And then he says, there are 20 opinions. What is this knowledge that it is uh, an opinion for everybody? What have you find of this? Yeah, that's not very weak, yeah. And the hadith must be addressing something that is already firmly and generally established. Number three, those who act upon the hadith should not cultivate the firm belief in their That the Prophet said it, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And we'll say, Muslim Muslim points out an important clarification of the second tradition. Is the weak hadith speaking about the virtues of duty and introduces any harm? Right, right, and uh, that's another thing. I don't want to get into. <laughs> the material. Yes. Uh, you're just referring to the things that we talk about about each hadith. Yes, yes, right. Yeah, so I'll I'll repeat what she said. So uh, Ibn Hajar has a specific um, uh, criteria, four criteria. One of them is um, it, the hadith should not be weak, very weak, or steeply weak, right, like he said. And second one is Qada um, al-Amal. It must be in the, in, the, in the beautiful virtuous deed. And the third one is, you don't say that it's what the Prophet ﷺ said. You don't make that judgment firmly. Okay? Hmm? Yes, you don't. Yeah, you don't prefer, prefer, preferably, you don't reference it. Yeah. Say in the, it, it was said. Or in the hadith. That's how you, the adab of using that one. And the fourth one, it... That's, uh, okay. Okay. And it must be under one of the rulings of Islam. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Okay. So these two hadith, so the, the, the Imam al-Ghazali tells us, اختلف الناس في العلمي, the scholars, we have different levels of, of scholarship, and they've all claimed what knowledge we should learn first. So what is the knowledge that, beca that is an obligation for us? Huh? Tawheed, Aqidah, yes. That's good. So uh, this is the same question asked uh, when, when uh, uh, a fresh, uh, someone who, become, who takes the path of deen and knowledge, and he asks, what should I learn first? He gets confused, and people tell him, you have to learn hadith. Some say you have to tafsir. Some say you have this and that and fiqh and so on. So they all get confused. 
the, que the, the answer for that, if you're a real serious a student of knowledge, the first thing that you have to master is Quran. Okay, and this is agreed upon. Okay, and after that, it's the Arabic language. I'm talking about serious students, not like me. Serious, like, and then after that is uh, fiqh, and the fiqh has to be done in steps and so on and so on, and then hadith and then so on. The sciences here, so they say, there's 20 opinions. But he'll speak about a few of them. So the people of, of Al-Kalam say it is Ha'aqidah, like you have said. So the people of Kalam, why are they calling it Kalam? It's the, the science of philosophy. Uh, when they studied Aqidah in those days, the Ash'ari uh, Aqidah was heavily, heavily philosophical. So they're really, really involved. And you have to learn this if you, if you if, if, as an obligation, it's your first obligation to learn. The second, uh, the second group of people are the fuqaha. Is bihi tu'araf al-ibadat wal halal wal haram, obviously, because you learn about the halal and the haram. And the other group of people are al-mufassirun wal muhadithun. He puts them in one group. Because when you study Quran, uh, after Quran, what, in, what interprets Quran is al-hadith. The first source of Qur'an interpretation is Qur'an, and then it's hadith. So the second, the, the, the other group of people are, are the al-mufassirun wa al-muhadithun, wa huwa al-ilmu kitab wa sunnah. And the other group is al-mutasawwifa. Again, I'm telling you that this is not a strange or, or weird idea. Al-mutasawwifa are people who, who, uh, who teach you adab who teach you behavior and psychology. They teach you how to think about your, your thoughts. What makes you think this way? What makes you behave in a certain way? So, al-muradu bihi, al-muradu al-ilm, qala ba'duhum, ilmu al-abdi bihalihi wa maqamihi ma'allah azza wa jal. It's your station with Allah. How do you, where are you? You know, are you really close? Are you being very uh, careful with Allah and so on? And, and this is nothing else but ilmul ikhlas wa afat al nufus. So to have the knowledge of that you need to be very sincere with all your actions and to also uh, be, be wary of the danger of yourself, the temptations and, and also on. And then he mentioned other things, but I'll, I'll, there's no need to mention the rest of the, of the sciences. And he says. Um, He wants to tell us now. So he says this. I'm supporting this. I'm supporting this. That it's an obligation for all of us to learn about Deen by the Hadith Buni al Islam wa Khams. Everyone knows the Hadith that that, that Islam was built on five pillars, uh, and it's also uh, part of Hadith Jibril. Mal Islam, al Islamu and. So it's the five pillars. But he doesn't go throughout the hadith. He just mentions the first one and he says, Shahadatu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad al Rasulullah. And then he explains that. Why why is it that? And also, um, there's, like, there are, there's different uh, things about. Um, about that, that we have to learn more than uh, like I told you I didn't prepare so let me just go through it very quickly okay so this first part shahadatu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammad rasulullah if it's an obligation for us to learn what do you need to know once you become a muslim Simply to believe that the Prophet ﷺ is the messenger of Allah and to obey him. And to, put, to obey whatever he is. That's it. As simple as that. He says, what becomes an obligation is when you have doubts and questions. When things come up in your mind. Just five months ago, someone said something in, 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 in Facebook and it threw me off. I know he was wrong, but I started questioning. What happens if someone 
has a doubt after becoming a Muslim and starts to believe and, and, uh, and then something goes crazy in his head. What happens if he's not able to find the answer and then he dies? Does this person die as a Muslim or a non-Muslim? Uh, anybody else? He has doubts. A Muslim? He has doubts, he has questions. And he, he doesn't act on huh? He doesn't act on one before his death. No, he's sincere. He wants to know. Okay? So here's what he says. Um... لو مات عقيب ذلك مات مطيعا لله. And he says, Imam Al Ghazali, رحمه الله, he says, and this is إجماع. Okay, this is a consensus between all the scholars that if someone passes away in that state, he passes away as a Muslim. And this is the رحمه الله, الحمد لله. وإنما يجب غير ذلك بعوارض تعرض الإسلام والإيمان وما كرب أن يرشى في عوارض تعرض. And then he says the other things. Now he, he, he expands because the hadith it says Shahadat wa illahi Allah wa qam salati wa ita'i zakat wa hajj al-bayti wa sawm al-ramadan Qam al-bayti wa hajj Okay And there's a, and there's a, a hadith that, that, that uh, puts um, that switches the last two Yeah Hajj al-bayti and sawm al-ramadan uh, so he expands into the other obligations of a Muslim that he needs to learn and he says so let's say someone becomes a Muslim at 10 in the morning when is he obliged to, be, to learn about Salah? we're talking about Fard this is just becoming we're just be, be, being very technical when? what? say, say MashaAllah. Okay. So, when is he obliged to learn how to wudu and to pray? When does it become an obligation for him to pray at the call of the event, which is Zuhur? So, he becomes obliged to learn about wudu because it's an obligation for the, for the salah when the time of salah comes in. Okay? And we, we chose this time because there's no salah between duha and Zuhur. If, if he had become a Muslim at Zuhur, like at, at two or three in the afternoon, then he has, an, he has, he becomes obliged to learn about wudu and salah immediately. This is fiqh, okay? What, so what does he do if he doesn't learn and he has to pray and it's like half an hour before or ten minutes before Asr? Not very important question, no? Uh, so if he has, if there's someone there that, that's with him, he leads the salah and he prays behind him. And then he spends time learning after us. Uh, it is modern time. It is modern time. Let's break. Is it modern yet? Yes. I, this is my first time ever coming to this university. Yes. It took me half an hour to find this place. And then on the Facebook, I checked there's no location. And then uh, I couldn't find. So, so far, you know what happened? I was like, okay, I'm going to give up. I asked one Canadian guy, he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. So then I drive, I found a hijabi. I said, yes, she must know. So I go to a hijabi. I'm like, do you know what MSA? He's like, what's MSA? I'm like, you don't know what's MSA? He's like, no, no. So I showed this address, this university. She's like, okay, maybe just go to the main hall, somewhere down there at the construction site. I said, okay, this is my last try. I go back there in the middle. I saw another hijabi run from her. Like, this is hijabi. I'm like, please, this is my last hope. I'm going to go home after this. I'm not going to come again if you can help me or not. She's about to go take the train or something. She's like, okay, fine. I'll take you to the so MSA club. Love. But she said, there's no actually MSA club. I'm like, I don't know. I'm not even from here. So like, like, just take me to Musala or somewhere. Or maybe I'm fine. And then somehow, somehow she started looking. She saw she found the address on the Instagram. And the Instagram, I had the address. But Facebook, I don't know if have it. So then I found the, the class. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah. <laughs> What's your name? Uh, Ilyas. Ilyas. Inshallah. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Barakallah. Thank you. So next time it will be good if it's on Facebook or somewhere. I just... Yeah, I don't have Facebook either. So, uh, for those who came late, I apologize for my lack of preparation. That's why we're speaking about everything else. But, uh, yeah.
so we, where we are now is, is um, at this subchapter of the Ihya, which is the Book of Knowledge, he's telling us uh, that, that it is an obligation, so we're making a difference between Fardu and Fard Kifaya, so what is an obligation for each uh, Muslim. So he, we spoke about Salah, everyone is, uh, is uh, obliged to learn about Salah and Siyam and, and Wudu and so on about shahadatu an la ilaha illallah but he, he, he starts this from the, the, the hadith bunya al-islam ala khams because every, if, you, if you obey Allah and his prophet and you, you believe in his message then everything else falls under that and then um, he says it becomes an obligation for a person to learn about fa- fasting when uh, this is very technical okay you know, someone wants to learn about fasting before Ramadan, but it becomes an obligation the night of, because that's when you make the intention, that's the first pillar. And so you learn that you have to abstain from food and drink and, uh, you know, intercourse with a spouse and so on. Uh, so it becomes the first night before. So the first night. And also, the one who wants to uh, learn, the one who has, who has no money, has no wealth, uh, doesn't have to learn about zakah. But as soon as he has al hawl as soon as he has a certain amount of wealth, nisab uh, and al hawl come, comes by. Al hawl is the the, the 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 amount of time required for you to pay the the zakah on on the wealth that you own. So he says, if that happens, then you you have to learn about the knowledge of zakah. So you should pay it. If you have one camel, this is an, this is an example. An example. You're only obliged to learn about the zakah of the camel. If you have gold and just gold, then you have you become obliged to learn just about that and so on. So it, it's an obligation on each person. And if you have the capacity, because Hajj man istata ilayhi sabila, al istata is the capacity, not just the wealth, but the physical capacity to to go uh, to Hajj. Uh, this is interesting here. He says something. Uh, he says. فَلَا يَكُونُ تَعَلُّمُهُ عَلَى الْفَوْرِ It is not an obligation for the person to learn it immediately. And that's because there's two opinions for Hajj. الْفَوْرُ wa What's the other one? الْفَوْرُ وَالْتَرَاخِي So الْفَوْرُ is to do it immediate, immediately. There's two opinions. As soon as you become capable and you have the wealth, then you have to do Hajj. Immediately. This year. Right now. Yeah. So if... Uh, is it considered that in 2019 the Saudi government raised the hash to like ten thousand dollars, seven thousand? Yeah. So it's way overpriced than how it used to be in the centuries in the past. Do we still have to go? Because uh, it has to do with your capacity. Okay. Uh, w- without getting into the the fiqh. Okay. So it's if you're capable physically and, and monetarily, and you have the time, you can take away from from work and so and so on. Then it becomes an obligation. So there's two opinions. One is immediate al al and the other one. Ala tarahi. Just give me. Uh, so apparently, Imam Shafi'i, uh, Imam, Imam Abu, uh, Imam Ghazali is a Shafi'i, right? And Imam Ghazali. Um, Sometimes has a, has a, a Maliki opinion because that's the first madhab of Imam Shafi'i. Um, so he says, and you have to do it immediately. فَلَا يَكُنُ تَعَلُّمُهُ بِالْفَارِ So it's not an obligation for the person to, to learn about Hajj immediately. You can delay it. Uh, that's that's apparently his his uh, opinion. So you, if you know that you're going to have enough money for the next ten years, and you're going to be healthy, inshallah, for the next ten years, then you may delay Hajj. So you're not obliged to learn it immediately. You may learn it. Sometimes between now and ten years, that's just uh, very, very, very technical. Uh, but uh, what is uh, interesting is uh, the Asoli principle, which says, "Man, ma kana wajibu." What is the "Ma la yatimu wajibu illa bihi fa huwa wajib"? If you have something which is wajib and it can only be completed by something else, that something else becomes wajib too. So if you uh, if you have to go to Hajj and uh, you uh, you can only do it if you work, that job becomes an obligation. It becomes an obligation for you to go to work and 
and to buy the ticket and to prepare and to work all uh, work out all the logistics. Yes. So if you have the money to go, uh, but you also have a debt to pay off. Yeah. The obligation to pay we're, talk, we're talking about uh, details of fiqh. I don't want to go. Want to go into? I can, we can do that. I love that uh, topic. If the if the debt is something which you are paying on an ongoing basis and you have an, an, an agreement with the debtor, then you can go to Hajj. Okay. If the debt is a certain amount and it ha must be paid before that, then, then you have to pay the debt before going to Hajj. So, so um, uh, okay, I forgot, now I forgot what I said. And then there is a turuk. So we spoke about the obligation, the things that are ob an obligation, but also the things which you have to avoid and, and not do, a turuk. Uh, which brings me to something very interesting. There's, there's a hadith about the Prophet ﷺ said in Bukhari Muslim, uh, I was given the, I, was, I am able to, to explain things in very little words and say very many things. So the Prophet ﷺ has one, one phrase of three words, and that one phrase is used in 200 rulings of fiqh. It's, he has such a, an eloquent way of simplifying and, and concising. I was sent with this special, with this very special gift. So the scholars have said, very interestingly, like Imam Ahmad, he says that ahkam uh, al-shari'a taduru fi thalath. That the shari'a has the entire shari'a can be summarized in three hadith. Innam al-amal bil-niyat. You know the story. You know this. We mentioned it earlier. Innam al-amal bil-niyat. That all the deeds are judged according to their intention. And this is um, the first hadith in Bukhari. And it's also in in the, in the in the beginning of most books of fiqh. The second one, al halal ubayn wal haram ubayn wa bainhum umur mushtabihat or mutashabihat. That halal is clear and haram is clear, and in between the things that are not perfectly clear to us, and so on. And the third one is uh, the hadith of, of Aisha radiallahu anha. Qalat anna Rasul Asim qal, man ahdatha fi dinina hadha amru man laysa minhu fa huwa rad. Anyone who invents something new in our religion, it is rejected. Bid'ah, anything which is not in our deen, is not is rejected. So these are the three things. And this hadith, the last one, man ahdatha fi amrina hadha fahu rad. There's different uh, siyah, there's different uh, wordings. This is the foundation of a tark. So that what we mentioned before is the obligations like salah and fasting and so on. But this one is the thing that we should not do. So, uh, and he, here he says, وَأَمَّا تُرُوكُ فَيَجِبُ تَعَلُّمُ عِلْمَ ذَلِكَ بِحَسْبِ مَا يَتَجَدَّدُ مِنَ الْحَالِ It becomes an obligation for you to learn those things uh, according. Exactly. MashaAllah. JazakAllah. According to your own state. Okay? And the same, like, like the same thing that we mentioned earlier about Al-Aqidah. It becomes an obligation for you to learn something that becomes fuzzy and doubtful. Then you have to learn it. It's an obligation for you to learn. So he says, وَذَلِكَ يَخْتَلِفُ بِحَالِ الشَّخْصِ إِذْ لَا يَجِبُ عَلَى الْأَذْكَمِ تَعَلُّمُ مَا يَحْرَمُ Of course, every, every person is different. It is not an obligation for someone who doesn't speak to learn how to keep quiet. That's not an obligation for someone who doesn't see to, 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 to lower his gaze. And so on. So he says, and this is, وَلَا عَلَى الْأَذْكَمِ البدوي تعلم ما يحرم الجلوس فيه من المس فيه من المساكين and so on so like I said I'm, I'm haven't prepared it so I have to read it for you uh, and then yes based on what you just said right now uh, so let's say that uh, one of the things that you're you're feeling fuzzy about is uh, a method that you want to follow but I guess studying a method is such a different field where it's it's a command for scholars. So, would you still, if even though it's not 
you don't really have to learn all the mega ahead. But if it's, if it's still a part of the area for you, in this case, if I might just say, does it become obligatory for you to go out of your way and learn the mega And learn the madahabs or the madhab? One madhab? Well, you have to learn the madhab for you to be Muslim. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. That's a good question. Jazakallah khair. So, um, you, you, you're going really far because you, you, that's something which some, uh, that's something which an advanced student does. And even an, uh, uh, an advanced student does not do. Uh, um, one does not learn the madhahib. It's too deep. It's too... And then you don't uh, go out of your way to choose. You choose the madhab of your environment. Okay, so if, if you happen to be in, in a Hanafi uh, environment in Pakistan, learn the Hanafi. Learn the Hanafi. There's no question about it. If you're growing up in, in, in Morocco, learn the Maliki. If you uh, if you um, in Somalia, what? Right. So you don't, you don't go that far. And even then, and even about the question of madhab, you don't <coughs> get it, you don't you're not obliged you're not obliged to to learn it in depth all you are obliged to do is the, to learn what you need to to know as an as an average person like i'm an average person all that i need to know is how to do wudu and how to pray and how to fast but i should learn it according to one madhab i'm not going to go and and try and understand what the Quran says about it, what the Hadith, that's beyond me. That's way beyond me. And even the scholars throughout history, they've simplified it for the masses like myself. They've made it very easy. They say, you want to learn how to fast? Look, we had our scholars of, let's say, in, in Pakistan, they've learned, they've uh, made it very, very sophisticated. But for the masses, shh, we can learn it in, in like in five minutes. So the question of fuzziness about which madhab that's something else for an advanced person. Yeah, it may, be, it may, become, it may become an obligation for you to learn a certain madhab. We, and we mentioned that last week. <coughs> Someone, a scholar, he went to an environment that had no Hanafi scholars. He was a Shafi'i. He became a Hanafi scholar. He gave up his, uh, you know, he's a, he's, a, he's a great Shafi'i scholar, but he wanted to fill that hole as a scholar he wanted to make sure that there was a representation of the Hanafi school in that, in that environment. So uh, we're talking about something much simpler than that. Uh, is, that clear? is that clear? Clear? Forgive me. Um, do you get to change your, your madhab? Yeah. Okay. We're, we're in, in North America. It's hard to say which madhab I really belong to. Unless you're, you're from like a, a background of a certain madhab. That's fine. You should follow that madhab. Especially if you think you're going to go back and live where the madhab is from. But otherwise, follow the madhab of your teacher. Right. Whatever is easiest. Whatever is easiest. And, and less complicated. Huh? No complication at all. Whatever is easiest to do, what is not, what does not represent something compl complicated. Make it simple. Yeah. Who? You sure? Exactly. I just answered that. I, if you if you find a teacher in your let let's say your your background is from the Hanafi school, if it's easy to find a teacher who teaches you Hanafi school, then do it. Hanafi madhab, then do it. It's it's a it's a perfect it's a perfectly legitimate authentic. Madhab, 100%. All of them, all four. The, they call them, the scholars call them Al Madahib al Mubaraka. They are the blessed school that survived centuries through, throughout history. And there were not hundreds but thousands of scholars through each, through each generation that supported and agreed and conformed to those, those amazing schools. So Al Madahib al Mubaraka. Yeah. Um, for uh, mixing madhabs, the the no no the only time you can mix madhabs but with knowledge is in Hajj. 
that's the only time the only time that scholars agree to do that but don't mix methods you have to follow one school one principle one fundamental unless you don't know that that's fine I'm a Maliki my one of my teachers is a Hanbali when I have a fatwa I go to my Hanbali teacher and accept his fatwa mouth shut I don't say anything he tells me this is the answer and I say thank you very much so you, you, your madhab becomes your teacher, especially if, if, it's, a, if it's an issue that is uh, not a common thing, if it's something that you have to, to think about. Are we getting to something? Uh, are we okay? It's okay. I mean, I don't want to confuse you or go into other topics without um, necessity. necessity. So I was like, I was doing that. So the next topic... And the reason why I was saying that is that's where we were talking about last week. Last week we were talking about how Imam al-Ghazali was making a case for the, the, the sciences of the heart. And, and then, and, and, and uh, whoever, you read this, right? MashaAllah. Yes. So you, you, you realize that at some point Imam al-Ghazali uh, gets, he goes all out to to make a case against the fuqaha. You know, he says, you guys don't do this. What, what if someone says, I, this is what it should be? So he's very, he, he, he hits on the fuqaha. Whereas he is a faqih. And at the end, so before I, I, I go on, let me tell you that Imam al-Ghazali, at the end of the chapter, he says, and don't think that I am saying anything about the great fuqaha. Uh, Imam Abu Hanifa and Malik and then uh, uh, Shafi'i and, and, and then he mentions many others. He said, don't think that I'm doing that. These are the fuqaha who understood that there is, that it is important to have the knowledge of this and, and this. Okay, it's the others who have focused on just the outside and the appearance and have not told us and spoke to us about this. What's the challenge? I don't know. <laughs> okay, so I'm not gonna we're not gonna talk about the uh, the, the semantics of uh, because it changes. For instance, I'll just give you an example. Okay, um, like I'm not a sheikh. I am nothing, right? So they, they call me ustad as as a, as a respect. You know who was a ustad back in the days of Imam Al Ghazali? It's the teacher of Al-Ghazali. He is the Ustad. Also, the person who reads Quran, we call him al qari In the days of the Tabi'een, al qari is a scholar. Ibn, Abba, Ibn, Ibn Mubarak says, I love al qari who's dressed in white. You know? So, all these semantics, have, so, but in today's term, um, there's also, uh, that's a whole topic by itself because we're talking about person who has ishtihad, the one who is a follower, the one who is a muqallid, and so on. So I don't want to get in there. Barakallahu fiqh, jazakallahu So we're saying that, how are about al-mu'taqadat wa a'mal al-qulub? What is the obligation of a person to know about? This is what we spoke about last week. But let's go through some of, of what he discusses here. فيجب عملها بحسب الخواطر فإن خطر له شك في المعاني التي تدل في okay yeah that's what we mentioned earlier but then he, he gets into he gets into how he builds this the fundament the, the, the foundation for this he says وما ذكره الصوفية من فهم خواطر العدو and what these this group of people what they, what they understood from خواطر العدو the whispers of the enemy ولمة الملك حق أيضا لما is the, the not the whisper but like it's a revelation it's like a it's a beautiful guidance that you get from, from your you, you're walking in, in your life and, and Allah guides you to do this or to do that ولكن في حق من يتصدى له فإذا كان الغالب عن الإنسان الفكرة 
So, and this is why he says, he gets into the second part of this book, which is called Rub'u Al-Muhlikat. This book is, is divided in four. The first one is Al-Ibadat, Al-Muhlikat, Al-Munjiyat. So the, the second part, he says, this is why we should learn about the things that can cause you to uh, to fall into danger. Al-Muhlikat, the book can destroy you. ما يرى نفسه محتاجا إليه. So if you feel that you need it, that you have to learn about it. If you have problems with uh, anger, that's what you should learn, how to control your anger. So if you have certain problems, these muhlikat, it becomes an obligation for you to learn about them. And then he mentions the hadith, and now this is the foundation of the hadith of this whole muhlikat. ثلاث مهلكات شح مطاع وهوى متبع وإعجاب المرء بنفسه Translate ثلاث مهلكات مهلكات the things that can destroy you شح المطاع Okay, so what's شح المطاع is sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm going back and forth What's شح المطاع Shuh is stingy. Yeah. So if somebody's like have no knowledge, what like how people would think? That's a good interpretation. Okay. And wahawa and muttaba. Just follow. Just follow your hawa. Yes. So you're just following your desires. Yes. Is it like heedlessness? No, it's following your your temptations. Okay. Okay. Last one. وإعجاب المرء بنفسه. Uh, I can't translate that. <laughs> Self-admiration. Self Self Sorry? Self That's right. That's right. <laughs> Happens to me when I look at myself in the mirror. <laughs> Just kidding. I get scared when I look at myself in the mirror. <laughs> so, three things that will destroy you. شح المطاع is stinginess that is extreme. And that's a good interpretation because I'll get there. Wahawan muttaba, and a desire that pulls you, a temptation that is pulling you, wa'ajabun mar ibn nafsi, and to be self centered and conceited. Always, I'm, I'm right, everyone is wrong. But my question is why, subhanAllah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mentions three, but Al Ghazali mentions 20. And, and I said Al Manawi mentions over a thousand. Huh? Because, huh? Because like you mentioned already, like we have this skill of like. Yes. إنما بعثت بجماع جوامع الكلم. I was sent with the capacity, beautiful character of saying a little bit, saying everything in a few words, saying everything in a few words. So which one of the ثلاث مهلي so شح المطاع is Someone who is stingy, it's impossible for a teacher, okay, or a parent, or someone who teaches or gives or shares to, to, to be evil. But someone who is stingy, every time he becomes stingy, that's some, some, something bad which you have to fight. وَهَوَانْ <coughs> مُتَّبَعْ And to have all these, there's a lot of desires. A lot of desires, like uh, to be... Um, Jealous, uh, to be angry, uh, stingy, uh, you name it. And that's also one of the greatest sources of, of all the, the, the self problems, the problems of the self. So they all spring out from these three. And there's not a human being that does not have these, that does not have these things. So even if you have, let's say you have problems with anger. Imam al-Ghazali says, if you fight anger, there's not, you will still have little bit. If you find stinginess, you will still have a little bit. If you find one of those characters, it always remains with you. In fact, all of these things are with us. So cannot, like, eliminate. cannot eliminate them. Okay? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then he mentions some of them here. And some of these terrible, evil uh, characters of the heart 
is like arrogance wal ujbu similar khawatiha and all the things that are similar tatabu hadhihi thalath yeah all of them like we said follow these three characters that the prophet mentioned sallallahu alayhi wasallam wa izalatuha fardu ain okay that's the conclusion and to remove these things is an obligation on each single one of us just like it's an obligation for each single one of us to learn how to do wudu for salah subhanallah we have so it's an obligation for us to become human beings to be beautiful human beings Yes, and with Allah. Yes, and with Allah. But basically, is is your behavior, and and you, like you said, with your own self and others. So that's absolutely right. So, and I think this is the conclusion. And and just tell me when when we are done, because uh, are we okay? Absolutely. We're done. I'm just reading, I mean, وَإِزَالَتُهَا فَرْضُ عَيْنِ Subhan, this is, this is, this blows my mind, because we, to know about this, and how do we know? وَلَا يَمْكِنُ إِزَالَتْ And we cannot remove it إِلَّا بِمَعْرِفَةِ حُدُودِهَا وَمَعْرِفَةِ أَسْبَابِهَا وَمَعْرِفَةِ عَلَمَاتِهَا وَمَعْرِفَةِ عِلَاجِهَا And we cannot remove it except by the knowledge of four components. The first one is its limits. What is it? What is that? What is a bad temper? Explain to me what is the limit of a bad thing? What that leads you? And what causes it? And what are the signs? What are the signs? And what and how do you remove it and cure it? Because the one who does not know it will fall in it. Uh, so so this all of these forms you have to learn. He says so he, that's what he goes through in the in the al uh, muhlikat. وَمِمَّا يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يُبَادَرَةِ الْإِقَائِهِ إِلَيْهِ إِلَى مِنْكُنْ قَرَانِينَ And I think this is uh, the last, the last uh, uh, book of his, of his uh, this book, Wallahu A'lam. And the things that we should know about, الْإِيمَانُ بِالْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ وَالْحَشْرَ وَالنَّشْرَ We also should know about the, the, the unseen. لَا رَبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ What's the first? Uh, what's the first for of Barak Bakara? Bil Ghaib, Bil Ghaib, to to believe the uh, in the unseen. So the belief in the unseen is the aqidah, wal imanu bil jannah, wal nar, wal hasr, in the belief in in paradise and hell and so on. Wa huwa tatimmatu kalimati shahada, and this is the culmination of this. You know when we said that he has. Started with Bunyan Islam ala khams. He did not go into as salah or siyam because that's normal. He says, and this is the culmination of those that phrase, Shahadatu an la ilaha Allah wa anna Muhammad Rasulullah. That's it. Those shahadatin. Wa hadihi tatimmatu kalimatay shahada. Fa innahu ba'da at tasdiqi bi kaunihi alayhi salatu wa salam ba'in fama. So because as soon as you believe that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is the Prophet, it goes by itself that you follow what he has said and to believe in his message. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he starts speaking about Fard Kifaya. I wonder if I should start here. Um, Want to do it a little bit, or you want to ask questions and, and answers? Okay. This is uh, interesting. It's very very f- uh, quick. And after this is done, uh, we go into what we have spoken about last week as well, which is uh, inshallah we should speak about this next week if we uh, Allah permits. Um, how the scholars, you know, after the Imam Al Ghazali. After Imam Al Ghazali concludes that these great scholars taught all of that, he shows us how they learned and taught it. 
how Imam Malik learned and taught these things, how Imam Shafi'i and so on, they, they learned and taught both sciences, the sciences of the outward and the sciences of the inward. Um, yes, go ahead. Bismillah. Questions? Bismillah. Uh, Sheikh, uh, so trying to understand this the first time I'm studying, listening to Imam Ghazali. So he's trying to tell us that we're supposed to work on our heart. So like, I'm a very simple person. Like I don't understand how do you do it. Like for me, I think my heart is right here in my chest pumping the blood. And uh, I want to know how do you work on your heart? How do you make your heart pious and righteous? And MashaAllah. All that. Jazakallah khair. Good, good question. I have the same question. Anyone else? We'll get to that. Okay. Uh, it's, I was just wondering if you could clarify something. Also, a question. You said, um, Imam Ghazali states that uh, for the two opinions in terms of Hajj, completing Hajj is not an obligation right away, according to his opinion. And then, like, you can delay it, right? If you feel like 10 years from now you're still going to have that same amount of health. Suppose, like, uh, a person, um, he, he gets, like, a lot of wealth in one year, but he's not sure about. He, he knows. He knows. He he will he will um, estimate that what will be part of his guess estimation. Okay. Yeah. So I mean that's a that's a very good question. Um, we uh, we're human beings, right? We're hum human beings, and we know what's wrong and what's right by by nature. We know. Uh, but we, we also have to, uh, to cultivate what is good. Like the, the Sahabi who came to the Prophet ﷺ with, with the, like they came as a de delegation. Uh, I'm sure you know the story. And he went into the mosque and he stayed behind. Everyone was excited to go and see the Prophet ﷺ. And he remained behind. He took a shower. He changed. And then he walked in. And the Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna fika khislatayn yuhibbuhum Allah. You have two beautiful characters that Allah loves. Al-hilm wa ta'anni. You have forbearance and you're not hasteful. Everybody else came in excited. They didn't wash, they were, you know, they, they didn't smell, uh, they didn't smell too good. And, and they rushed and they, they wanted to meet the Prophet. I would do the same. But this person was cool. And then he asked him a question. Uh, what's the Arabic of it? Was ajibilatun uh, or muktasaba? Is it something which is natural about me, or something which I have acquired? He says baljibilla. For you, no, it's a natural thing. So some people are naturally cool. Some people are naturally generous, like Hatim uh, al Some people are naturally Smiley, some people, but you have to learn. It's a jibilla, it's part of you. But if you don't have it, you have to learn it. You have to know about it to learn them. But there is an, a very beautiful Arabic uh, saying it says, Your natural state is a little stronger than what you learn. Like, like you, you try, you try, you try, but sometimes it gets too strong and then you, you lose it. Because that's how you really are. And a beautiful story about that is, that's, that's the difference between, between us and animals. We can learn these beautiful characteristics. The, the story uh, that comes with this proverb, <coughs> is uh, there were two, two people. Like, this is like origin, Salaf uh, al-Salih. There's one, one Khalifa and one teacher. So uh, Khalifa tells uh, the teacher, uh, look, I have taught my cat to, um, what was he doing? I don't know. He was doing something very, very special. So uh, he's, he's, he's quiet and he does this. And, and uh, he says, okay. Next day he brought uh, a mouse. And then, and then he, he started to show, him, show off with his cat. And then he let the mouse go and the cat went crazy. That's his tatabwa. That's his natural state. 
So we, we have we have that natural we have the natural thing, but we have to learn how to cultivate it. Each human being natural is different. We all have different natures, but we have to learn how to cultivate good things. Okay. That's why when someone came to the Prophet, he tells him, "Awsini." Uh, he told him, "La taqdab." Don't get angry. And the other one came, says, "Awsini." He gave him another advice. So each person had a, had a problem that he needed to fix. So you need like a sheikh to tell you what to work on. Sure. It's like an average, simple, someone like me, Shaitan ka waswas you know, make me, okay, I think I need to work on this or that. But if you have a scholar who's righteous and muttaqin and salihin and his heart is clean, you got he it. can help you. You got right? it. It's either you have a teacher yeah. that can teach you yes. or a teacher that you sit with okay. or people that are pious and good, really uh, very, very kind and, and pure hearted. Just sitting with them will benefit you. And even if they don't say a thing, and even if you don't see them because you're blind, may Allah protect us. There's the barakah. There's a barakah. If you sit with your parents, the barakah of your parents permeates you. They may be the most uh, un- unknowledgeable people, but they, that barakah will permeate you. It, you will benefit from it. It will make you a better person. Allah knows. Allah subhanahu wa Just my last question. I'm so sorry for your last question. How can I find these kind of righteous sheikh people? Like, I moved to Ottawa one month ago, and this is just my own observation. People are so busy with dunya. and like Search. Like look for them. Look for them. Fake, westernized. No, look look for them. Uh, I mean, and don't and don't judge. Okay. Look for them. You may, they might not look like that on the surface, yeah. but when you get close to them and you sit, you will benefit. Yeah, don't judge. Don't okay. just look for them, inshallah. Um, I just have one quick question. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, you can believe the book is called Reclaim Your Heart. You can also look at brothers and this speech will be good. What's it, who's the author? Who? Yasmin Mujahid. Oh, Yasmin awesome. Mujahid. Mashallah, yeah. mashallah. It's all about like purifying. I recommend it. Ghazali, next week, inshallah, we'll talk about it. Uh, Sorry? Or Friday, I, I'm going to try and prepare. I'm going to try and prepare something for um, uh, Ottawa U. Brother Ahmed Khalil is having uh, this, uh, these lectures on Ihya al So I told him, I'll, I'll, I'll do half an hour on, on Imam Ghazali. Friday, Friday. Not, no, 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 it's in Ottawa U. Jazakumullah khair. May Allah bless you. Barakallah fikum, all of you. Jazakumullah khair. And also because he lived it. I mean, and he was, he was, uh, he didn't have any bad intentions or anything like that. He didn't take sides of the rulers or anything. But he was, he was so deeply involved in the, in the theory that he did not learn about the essence. That's what he's saying. You're not teaching us the essence. You're just teaching us a theory. That's what he's saying.